But what the blockchain allows us to do is have the best of both worlds. Because everything is on the code, I don't need to be communicating with everybody because I can see everything. This is a technology that is a vehicle for the masses to take back control over things that have been deciding for them for so long. In a proper decentralized autonomous corporation, there are no shareholders. The, the token holders are the complete beneficiaries. These networks don't depend on anything. They are completely autonomous code that in some ways are unstoppable. Uh, the way that I see the blockchain is just mass scalable secure data transfer, really. It's just that secure word. And as we continue to go forward, we're going to see so much more than money and value being transferred. We're going to see every piece of content put on the blockchain because we know that it can't be hacked, because we know that it actually went onto the internet at that moment in time. Every timestamp will be on the blockchain so that we know that it actually happened at that time. It wasn't changed later. So really, the way that I boil down the blockchain, as we are able to create more scalable solutions and more and more data can fit on to the blockchain, what you're really looking is the next iteration of the internet, a secure version of the internet. So businesses are actually becoming blockchains, and the blockchains themselves are the business. Everything resides on the chain. In five years from now, if you don't timestamp your articles on the blockchain, you're going to be considered a fraud. If you don't put your content on the blockchain, you're going to be considered a revisionist or someone that censors material, right? This is becoming a part of best practices, and these organizations will become something that people can trust at a degree that you can't trust centralized entities. So it's completely solved the communication problem. We don't need to be in the same office because we're all working on the same piece of code. So what we're really saying is, in a, in a, in a world run by code, right, when code is contract, we're moving away from, from, legal, from legally binding to, te to technologically binding. Code is a much better expression of intent. If you think about it, we're all turning into coders. Every time you get on a chat and you do slash emoji, you're coding. right? And so what we're doing is we're coding these companies. And because it's so transparent, and because it's so auditable, and everybody can work on it at the same time, communication is ubiquitous. So right now, there's a big gap between uh, what existing platforms can do and what we know the space is capable of. So you guys have probably heard, how many people have heard of Bitcoin, Ethereum, these projects out there? So most everyone at this point. Well, uh, what, what we're really dealing with uh, is, yes, we had the advent of being able to do peer-to-peer -peer value transfer, uh, but they're very slow, and they're very expensive, and they're very limited. If you take a look at Bitcoin, it can only process about three transactions per second. Ethereum's up there with 10, 13 transactions per second. And when you look at the mining costs associated with proof of work, we're really looking at something like 50 to 100 US dollars per transaction. Right? that we actually pay miners through token inflation before fees. Right? So then there's fees on top of that. Now, when you're looking at something so slow and expensive, it doesn't really have a wide range of use. It works for uh, like a gold settlement-like function, so for just transferring large amounts of value around seldomly. Right? We can use the blockchain in that instance. But when it comes to time stamping things, putting content on the blockchain, putting likes on the blockchain, um, social media, it's not, an, it's not applicable. Right? We can't use those platforms. So what EOS, EOS is, is it's a pro delegated proof of stake blockchain network um, that uh, massively increases the throughput that we're able to uh, push through on the blockchain. So we're talking about scaling up to millions of transactions per second uh, at nominal costs. And that very much broadens the use case of the blockchain. Uh, one example uh, of this type of technology is a social media platform called Steemit. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. Um, but Steemit is the most used blockchain in the world, and it is a social media platform that was designed, implemented, launched, and had 150,000 users a day in less than six months. And imagine uh, a Facebook-like network where every time you're submitting content based on the number of people that like it, right, you're actually getting paid a token. Right? And advertisers on that platform need to buy that token in order to advertise with the platform. So it removes the shareholders from the ecosystem and closes the value loop to the actual people that are creating the value. 
right? The content producers themselves. And so EOS is a platform that allows people to build projects like steamit.com, things that have millions of transactions, potentially millions of transactions per second in requirement, right? If you tried to take a Steemit-like platform and put it on something that was on proof of work, whether it's Ethereum or Bitcoin, one, it wouldn't even be possible, but two, just the likes alone associated with the social media network would cost billions of dollars a year on a platform like, uh, like Ethereum in order to actually put it on the blockchain because it's so labor intensive. Really, tokens are just a unit of account. So um, when we say, what is a token? Is it a security? Is it a commodity? Is it nothing? Um, at the end of the day, the blockchain or a token is just an Excel spreadsheet, right? So the reality is it, it's anything, right? Every token is inherently very different. And yes, we don't need one new money, right? All these tokens are not just competitors to Bitcoin. Right? They're a unit of account for these communities, which are decentralized organizations. This just gives you a little bit of an overview on kind of you know, why tokens matter. These tokens represent ownership or stakeholder or beneficial interest in the network. Most of these decentralized autonomous corporations are biologically self-sufficient. And what that means is, is that, for example, we can add inflation to a network. In EOS's example, after 100, or 1 billion tokens are distributed, every year 5% more tokens are distributed to the network. And anyone can propose a smart contract. So any one of the people in this audience could come in and say, hey, I think that we should spend new tokens on this. You can pay this entity, and I will do marketing, and I will do all of these things for the platform. And if the network decides that they want to allocate value to you, just by a simple vote, the network is sufficient in the sense that it creates its own value, it mints these new tokens and distributes them, right? I could create a whole other business in which proceeds went through a decentralized structure and were distributed to hackathons and invested into projects, all these things done by the public in a completely transparent way. When you start to introduce a token into these networks and all of your users are exposed to this token, it means everyone has complete aligned interests and everyone's exposed to the health of the organization. So there's a viral component, right, that, is even, that even displaces the most viral things we've seen to date because it brings all your users into the growth of the organization and they become directly invested in making it succeed. What we're really moving into is the era of open source companies and the types of innovations that you're seeing with open source technology, the explosion in development in projects like GitHub, I'm sure all of you have heard, right? The, the core of open source. It allows us to all build on each other's work. In the future, when I wake up, I may not even have an employee, employer. I may be able to just work for absolutely any company in the world that I can add value to. Imagine that. You, you wake up and say, I have a great idea to Airbnb. You examine the code, you start writing something, right? And you put it out there, the, the public accepts it, forks you in, the network pays you a bounty. Now you've got a decentralized network, a piece of code that has essentially just hired you, that has taken your ideas, has incorporated it into the organization, right? And you have been paid, and they don't even know who you are, right? So how do centralized entities compete with this? In my opinion, they can't. And I actually believe that decentralized autonomous organizations will, at some point in time, we're talking longer horizons, will disrupt every single centralized alternative. So I'm a big believer that ultimately uh, the blockchain is empowering communities to disrupt the company. All right. Um, and over time, you're going to see these communities really start to pick off the largest tech organizations in the world. And it's going to start with centralized technology platforms, things like Facebook, things like Uber, uh, things where uh, you can essentially open source the code. So, uh, you know, if you take a look at something like Facebook, you have a team of developers in a room guarding their code, building this proprietary formula. Well, once you open source it and you bring in a community, 
community, you can essentially have potentially a billion developers around the world adding value to that project, right? The token holders or the stakeholders are the ones deciding which things get forked in, what kind of privacy do we want to let out in order to bring in more ad revenue that goes to our users, and there becomes checks and balances instead of just one organization making all those decisions on our behalf. Uh, so I think that these centralized technology platforms are the first to really get disrupted, and you're already starting to see it. Uh, the, really, the, only, the only thing that's been stopping it up until this point has been that the lack of, of these platforms, these underlying technologies that enable these developers to go and launch something competitive enough. But we're going to really see that this year. Uh, and uh, 2017 was really all about Bitcoin really all about digital value transfer. And I think that as we go forward this year and next year, the conversation is going to sh shift to these what I decentralized autonomous communities or DACs. Um, as people start to understand these technologies better and they start to get used to certain degrees of transparency and assurances, um, they're going to start to demand more from their governments in terms of the way money is printed, the way money is spent, and the transparency associated with each of those steps along the way. You know, if I, if I go through Airbnb, Uber, all of these types of things, I can give you an example of how what, you can start to learn what a decentralized alternative would look like. And you start to ask yourselves, can the existing centralized entity compete with the decentralized autonomous network in which it is owned by all of its users and its writers, its drivers, its content writers? When you have millions of people that are invested in making something successful, how does a group of 100 shareholders compete with that? And my belief is that you just can't. We know that not everything can be a presidential election. We know that the public doesn't always make better decisions than a centralized group. And that's why the design of each and individual decentralized autonomous corporation is so important. Because you know, if I, if I create something where the whole community is just electing three groups right, to do the, the centralized portion for me, I've essentially des decentralized the top layer, but I'm actually allowing centralized bodies within the whole ecosystem to perform those functions. Bounty systems, when the network says anyone can add value, if you can do this, we will pay this amount, a centralized entity can step up and say, I'll fill that function for you, right? So it's really a combination, the full stack of decentralized governance with centralized you know, uh, uh, execution. But that is exactly where we're at. I would say if you know, centralized governance being efficient here, central, we're, we're, we're just starting to explore what decentralized governance can do. And as we continue to go forth and we have more robust technologies and these formulas can learn from the decisions being made by the public, um, it will continue to become more and more and more decentralized. And eventually, you'll have layers and layers and layers that will be these incredibly complicated and complex mechanisms, these huge overarching formulas that govern, for example, an entire insurance agency, right? Where the game theory has been tested on every single component of every single layer so that you're able to operate in a completely decentralized fashion. But at the shareholder level, at the vested interest level, what I'm seeing is that the companies moving into the space, when you're moving into content, the growth that I have seen, companies like Steam at having 100,000 users a day in three months, I've never seen anything like it in my life. I believe in what I'm calling a publisher model for decentralized autonomous corporations. I believe that these DACs, as DACs I call them, um, are, are, are like MMORPG video games. They're like big online video games in the sense that you bring millions of people together in a video game. And what is that technological infrastructure output? It uses the community and the technology to deliver entertainment to everybody. But these are very similar, except they're, they're outputting, right? Problem, real world problem solving or provision of goods and services. So they look and function very much like MMORPG video games. So I actually think that a centralized entity or even decentralized development team can spend time creating these things, potentially years, on their own dime, and essentially write blueprints on how these things function. And in the process of distributing the tokens to all the people that will then be the beneficiaries of that network, that can be a monetization event to pay for the initial investment that went into the years of development in order to deliver that to the community.
so yes, I think that when you have a group of shareholders, right, that represents very little of the user base itself, it's just inherently inefficient, right? The users don't care about it other than to extract value. The shareholders don't care about it other than to extract value, right? And so there's no alignment of interests, and you're very limited in what you can do. And as those come together, right, and, and what we're seeing is that correct product design of decentralized autonomous corporations is to ensure they do come together, right? The value transfers, it's not that it transfers for one to the other, they become the same people.